When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done Having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Kitties, it is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, here to bring you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. Now, for tonight's tea, I'm drinking hot buttered rum. I admit to using the mix that you can buy in the store. Typically what I do is I, I heat up some milk, add a little of the mix in, a little bit of butter, stir it up, then a shot or two worth of rum. It's quite positively perfect. Now, remember, kitties, if you would like to support this show, please look us up on Stitcher Radio, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, or iTunes, and give us a positive review. The more good reviews, the more people will tune in to listen. Now, with that bit of shameless self-promotion out of the way, I give you tonight's episode of Twisted Tea Time, Sinister Signals. <laughs> Communication has been a hallmark of your species since the first hairy brute of a human put a couple syllables together that had a specific meaning beyond the grunt of effort it took to throw a rock at something or rut something. Since then, I must admit, you've advanced at quite the impressively clumsy rate. Not only do you have numerous convoluted languages, but you have multiple ways of communicating beyond mere speech or the written word. Radio waves, TV signals, hell, even Morse code show you as a collective species actually have potential. Though, I must admit, 2016 strikes me as being indicative of your entire race entering into a very regressive period of their development. But that's merely my own optimism for the continued existence of your pitiful race beyond the next century showing. What can I say? I'm just a little ray of sunshine. These methods of communication can get even further complicated by things like codes or encryption. And let's not forget the impact they have on storytelling. Radio was once the mainstay for news, music, and my personal favorite, audio dramas. But with the advent of the internet, and of course TV, the practice is all but dead. Sure, there are a few FM and AM stragglers, some morning zoo jockeys that have yet to die out. There are even some holdouts of radio hobbyists. People exploring bands of communication long since abandoned, and likely unmonitored. Well then, let's take a look and see what happens with one gentleman who begins exploring these abandoned airwaves and finds himself listening to Dark Radio. Dark Radio by Jason Mel. The general span for FM radio stations usually falls in the range of 79 kilohertz to 108 kilohertz. AM stations generally fall in the range of 530 kilohertz to 1750 kilohertz. Within these frequencies, 99.9% .9 of audible radio lives. In these parameters, you will find talk radio, rock, rap, country, etc. Basically everything you generally associate with radio. 
outside these areas were military stations used during the wars and some rogue stations that have all been since shut down or discontinued. Those areas are known as dark frequencies or dark radio. No one with specialized radios have heard anything on dark radio in years. Until now. One day, a man came home from the flea market with a highly sensitive military-grade frequency radio. His wife thought it was a worthless piece of crap, but the husband, being a huge history buff, thought it was a wise investment. He had hoped to find an active military station, or one that was set up on a constant loop, broadcasting Soviet-era information or war propaganda. He would spend hours a day scanning for stations and hoping he could find something out there that would make his purchase worthwhile. He would pick one precise frequency at a time and scan the entire range for any activity. Several days went by digging through static, and he had nothing to show for it, until the day he finally heard something. It was very grainy at first. He tried to fine-tune it as best as possible, but he was barely able to make out what was being said. He could hear words, but he was unable to understand them. He went out the next day and bought a sound recorder. When he turned on the radio, he was shocked how much clearer the signal came in. It was still grainy, but he could make out some of it. In a low groan, he heard, We have. We have? We have what? The man thought to himself. The possibilities were endless. The man noticed that the words kept repeating on a loop. He had found exactly what he was looking for an old abandoned loop station. He turned on the recorder and tried to record the sound as best as he could. The next day he was going to take it to a studio and see if they could find out what exactly was being said. The man barely got any sleep that night. He was filled with excitement about making such a historical discovery and the world-changing effect it could possibly have. He figured it would be best not to tell his wife about the discovery until he knew for sure what it was. Before he left the house that morning, he turned on the radio again. He set the recorder down when he realized he wouldn't need it. The station was now a lot clearer with minimal static. It was as if the station was reaching out to his radio. We have 21 followed by the sound of two bells, one high-pitched and one low-pitched. The man sat in awe, listening to the loop over and over again. We have twenty-one. We have twenty-one. We have twenty-one. He would hear the two bells in between each repeating phrase. 21. Is that a passcode for something? Do they have 21 objects of some sort? He was perplexed. He spent the day doing research, but he ended up with nothing. No mention of the phrase, We have 21. Played any significance in history. He waited a day hoping that the signal would improve in case there was something he couldn't yet hear. When he turned on the radio the next day, he was disappointed to hear the same voice repeating the same phrases over and over again, with the two bells in between, although something seemed different. It took him a few minutes to realize it, but a faint clicking was heard in the background. It didn't take him too long to realize that it was Morse code. He spent an hour on the computer translating it from scratch and was thrilled to see that it spelled out coordinates. Using his GPS, he was able to find the location. It was about a two-hour drive from where he was. After driving down a few side roads and one really long one deep into the woods, he had finally reached his destination. 
It was a large clearing with a massive, cube-shaped building in the center. It must have been at least four stories tall. All four sides were gray, with no marking on the outside as to what the building even was used for. He walked around the entire perimeter of the building and found the only door available. The door was, surprisingly, unlocked. He walked into the building and saw a giant empty room, dimly lit by dusty rooftop windows, with a single wooden desk and a chair in the middle. The place seemed like a giant airplane hangar from the inside. He approached the table and saw a small desk lamp, illuminating radio broadcasting equipment complete with a transmitter and a microphone. It was emitting a deep, ominous groaning noise. This made no sense. There's no one here. Where is that sound coming from? He listened to the groan and noticed that it was changing sound, volume, and length. It didn't take him long to realize that it was actually saying, We have twenty-one. Extremely slowly. He listened for several minutes until the groaning voice stopped after completing the phrase. None of this made any sense to him. Who was saying this? There's no one here. Why is it sounding so slow? Why is it now silent and not repeating? And where are the be- At that moment, two deafeningly loud bells rang throughout the room. They didn't sound like small bells anymore. They sounded like massive church bells being struck with a sledgehammer just inches above his head. He covered his ears and collapsed to the ground. When the sound finally stopped, he uncovered his ears. He looked around the building again. He noticed it was significantly darker than before. The windows on the roof were no more. There was no door nor was there ever a sign of one existing. The lamp on the desk was still lit, and all the broadcasting equipment was still there. He was now surrounded by silence and darkness. Curiosity eventually got the best of his wife later on that day. She turned on her husband's radio. Clear as day, as if he were standing right there in the room with her, she heard his voice. We have twenty-two. It was silent for a brief moment. Then, static. Welcome back, kitties! I suppose that was an example of the phrase, curiosity killed the cat, being used without its latter half. Ah well, at least our nameless protagonist has a job wherever he's trapped. He'll be kept busy for quite some time. Yeah, moving on, radio may once have been popular, and before the internet all but hammered a nail into that coffin, Television was building the casket. Of course, TV has come a long way as well, and there have been a few incidents of certain broadcasts being hijacked by unknown persons. One of the most famous hijackings would likely be the Max Headroom interruption of 1987. Well, here we get to learn of a more recent far more disturbing, and likely far less known, broadcast interruption. Broadcast Interruption by Anonymous You might already have heard of the TV broadcast hijacking in Seneca, South Carolina. 
The story has gained pretty wide currency on the internet, and part of the broadcast is available on YouTube, assuming it hasn't been taken down for whatever reason. For the uninitiated, the Seneca hijacking is one of the lesser-known broadcast signal intrusions. It was big news here, but the nation news media barely touched on it. Anyway, I've decided to jot down my impressions of the whole thing, even though other eyewitnesses have already described it more eloquently than I could. I was home on winter break when it happened, making chemistry flashcards in front of the TV. No one else was around. After watching the umpteenth Law & Order rerun, I got bored and started channel surfing. A couple minutes later, I stumbled onto this shitty public access channel where, <laughs> bizarrely enough, my old high school Latin teacher was reciting a poem while wearing this dorky three-cornered hat. I watched for a few minutes and had a good laugh. I remembered him as a pretty serious guy not the sort of person who'd embarrass himself in public like this. When suddenly, there was this staticky crackle, and the screen cut to this multicolored test pattern. Before I had time to change the channel, there's another crackle, and this weird cartoon shows up on screen. The animation style was detailed, but kind of jiggly and rough. It reminded me of those old anti-drug PSAs. Anyway, it seemed normal enough at first. An ordinary-looking middle-class family eating breakfast together at a round kitchen table. There was a mom with an old-fashioned hairdo, a dad, two cherub-faced kids, a boy and a girl, all very Norman Rockwell. The family is making banal small talk, the dad complains about his day at the office, the kids prattle on about soccer practice, and so on. Gradually, though, the scene starts to get slightly... sinister. A green light is seeping through the open window, and the family starts to acquire a jaundiced, unhealthy look. Their skin changes color, and their eyes become sunken. In the background, a droning radio broadcast slowly becomes perceptible. The announcer gives the date as November 15, 2017, and starts to go on and on about some strange crisis. You can barely hear what he's saying. He says something about a green light, melting flesh, mutations, strange shapes emerging from the sea, Again and again, the phrase, Report to the nearest shelter immediately, is audible. Still, the family keeps eating breakfast as if nothing was happening. And here's where it gets really macabre. The family finishes eating breakfast, and the mom loads the kids into a minivan. By now they look really unhealthy. Their bodies are skeletally thin, the whites of their eyes are a sickly yellowish color, and their hair is disheveled. The car drives through a landscape bathed in the green glow from before. Strange shapes bob in and out of the screen, but you can't quite tell what they are. And all the buildings the car passes look weathered and deserted. Finally, the car stops at a playground and the mom drops off the kids before driving away. There are large, odd-colored rocks all over the ground, and moaning can be heard in the distance. The kids hang mirthlessly on the monkey bars for a while. Eventually, the camera pans over the playground, and you can see that the rocks littering the ground aren't rocks at all, but naked human forms horribly disfigured. They seem to be either growing into or from the ground. I, I can't say which. And they are very much alive. Behind the monkey bars, a tree can be seen with a human face growing from the trunk. Its features are writhing and contorted in agony. The scene suddenly shifts to a white-collar office where the children's father is stooped over a desktop, typing away. 
His features are as sunken and diseased as that of the other family members, and the office is covered in a green glow. In the other cubicles, fleshless corpses sit upright at their desks, frozen in death. Finally, we see the family return home for the evening, walking through the front door together. Their skin is no longer simply jaundiced, but actually melting off, dripping from their outstretched arms and running down their faces in drops. As they are literally falling to pieces, the family sits down in the dining room and begins wordlessly to eat dinner. Their flesh becomes more and more amorphous, ribbons of skin dangling from their bodies like the tendrils of an octopus. I can barely describe it, but they somehow begin to... merge with the chairs they are seated on. Or rather, their skin grows over them. By now, their skin has the consistency of melted ice cream, and they are barely recognizable as human, except for their eyes, which somehow remain intact. The camera zooms closer and closer to the table, and finally their eyes all move directly towards the camera, conveying a feeling of unfathomable sadness. The screen goes black and large white letters appear on the screen. Report to the nearest shelter immediately. Remaining at private residences is strictly prohibited. And with that, the screen turned to static. I stared in stunned silence for a few minutes before the Baynal local channel switched back on. And that's all I know, really. I almost thought I was dreaming until the paper reported the story the next day. God knows what really happened. A ridiculously elaborate prank? An ill-advised viral marketing campaign? The crazier parts of the internet have their own theories. Ah, you've returned! Well, I hope you've enjoyed that little short hop into television. Hopefully, that little cartoon was merely some sick and creative joke, rather than any sort of prediction of the future. As I imagine, melting skin would not be a particularly enjoyable experience. Now, a little history lesson to lead into our next couple stories. Back in 1974, scientists broadcast a message into space from the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. It was a simple message aimed at the M13 cluster of stars some 25,000 light years away. Of course, we haven't heard anything back yet. But what might happen if we did receive a message? What message might we expect to get if someone or something out there broke radio silence? Radio Silence by Ben C. Bartford 36,400,000. That is the expected number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, according to Drake's famous equation. For the last 78 years, we had been broadcasting everything about us. Our radio, our television, our history, our greatest discoveries to the rest of the galaxy. We had been shouting our existence at the top of our lungs to the rest of the universe, wondering if we were alone. Thirty-six million civilizations. Yet in almost a century of listening, we hadn't heard 
a thing. We were alone. And that was until about five minutes ago. The transmission came on every transcendental multiple of hydrogen's frequency that we were listening to. Transcendental harmonics, things like hydrogen's frequency times pi, don't appear in nature, so I knew it had to be artificial. The signal pulsed on and off very quickly with incredibly uniform amplitudes. My initial reaction was that this was some sort of binary transmission. I measured 1,679 pulses in the one minute that the transmission was active. After that, the silence resumed. The numbers didn't make any sense at first. They just seemed to be a random jumble of noise. But the pulses were so perfectly uniform, and on a frequency that was always so silent, they had to come from an artificial source. I looked over the transmission again, and my heart skipped a beat. 1,679. That was the exact length of the Arecibo message sent out 40 years ago. I excitedly started arranging the bits in the original 73 by 23 rectangle. I didn't get more than halfway through before my hopes were confirmed. This was the exact same message, the numbers in binary from 1 to 10, the atomic numbers of the elements that make up life, the formulas for our DNA nucleotides. Someone had been listening to us and wanted us to know they were there. Then it came to me. This original message was transmitted only 40 years ago. This means that life must be, at most, 20 light years away. A civilization within talking distance? This would revolutionize every field I have ever worked in. Astrophysics, astrobiology, astro... The signal is beeping again. This time, it is slow. Deliberate, even. It lasts just under five minutes, with a new bit coming in once per second. Though the computers are, of course, recording it, I start writing them down. Zero. One. Zero. One. Zero. One. Zero. Zero. I knew immediately this wasn't the same message as before. My mind races through the possibilities of what this could be. The transmission ends, having transmitted 248 bits. Surely this is too small for a meaningful message. What great message to another civilization can you possibly send with only 248 bits of information? On a computer, the only files that small would be limited to... text. Was it possible? Were they really sending a message to us in our own language? Come to think of it, it's not that out of the question. We had been transmitting pretty much every language on Earth for the last 70 years. I begin to decipher with the first encoding scheme I could think of. ASCII. ASCII. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. That's B. Zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. E. As I finish piecing together the message, my stomach sinks like an anchor. The words before me answer everything. Be quiet, or they will hear you.
Ah, welcome back once more. I know, I know, another short one. Well, anyway, kitties, it sure does appear to be silent out there in the vastness of space. Perhaps it's because everyone is afraid that something is, in fact, listening. Something we really shouldn't want to hear us. Well, we touched on receiving a warning of the possibility of such a sinister presence taking note. But what if, you know, that wonderful phrase that is the start of so many stories, what if that very something actually had heard us and decided to come down from the quiet sky? The Quiet Sky by Ryan Brenneman It started when we called out to the stars, into the darkness. We felt so small, tumbling through vast emptiness while clinging to the skin of the world, and without a single reason why. We were curious, yes, but ultimately I think we were just terribly frightened. And we were young, so very young. We were children. And like a lonely, lost child, we did the only thing we could think of to make it stop. We did what we thought we had to do to make the universe make sense. We called for help. For years, we scanned the sky for a sign. We sent signals to the stars in the darkness beyond. Are we alone? But the skies were quiet. Always so quiet. Leaving us to our own makings. But crying children never cease, and neither did we. We sent calls into every corner of space for decade after decade. We refused to believe no one was out there. They had to be. Yet for some unknown reason, they never answered us. Everyone remembers when that changed. They think it responded to the Arecibo message from 1974. The response to the Arecibo message was received almost three months ago, in two separate parts. The first part of the message was received at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory in California. The Allen Telescope Array picked up what sounded like static interference that continued on for over an hour. It consisted of unintelligible screeching and buzzing sounds that continued without pause for the whole hour. The meaning of this message was never discovered if it had one. The only thing we knew was that the signal's origin came from somewhere in the Hercules constellation near Messier 13. As soon as the signal stopped, the real message began. We made contact that day, and we were asked a question. Who is there? It came not through the radios, but as a voice, a voice inside all of our heads, asked the question to all of us. I heard it, my wife heard it, the young heard it, and the old heard it, even the deaf heard it. Everyone, everywhere heard this voice whisper that question in their heads, in every language on earth. I remember it almost too clearly. It asked in that familiar yet indescribable voice that's always there in my mind. It was like one of my own thoughts had gone rogue and had decided to speak directly to me. The world seemed to stop as everyone listened for what came next. Where are 
you. The heavy question seemed to linger in our minds for hours afterwards, and then for days, and then for weeks. That day changed everything. There were the doubters from the very beginning, and the holy ones who claimed that God had spoken to all of us and that the time to repent was now. There were those who claimed they'd heard nothing, and those who'd claimed that the aliens had given them their own secret messages. And of course, there were those who truly believed that we had been contacted for the first time by an extraterrestrial race like us, one ready to communicate, ready to lead us out of the dark. We were wrong. We never made contact with alien life, at least nothing comprehensible or discernible to human understanding. The stars are vast, and in their vastness, our voices had touched the ears of something truly incomprehensible, something hungry and malevolent, the voice. We realized our mistake when the ground started to groan. Beneath our feet, everywhere, the ground seemed to moan. The muffled sounds shook through the dust and dirt below us. No one knew what was causing it, at least not until the calls started coming in. The graveyards were screaming. All at once, the dead had started screaming. Every deceased man, woman, and child was turning in their graves. All the animals did too. Every dog. Every cat, everything that had ever walked this earth. The cries of ancient whales shook the seas, and the shrill screeching of birds echoed in the forests. The caskets shook, and the morgues howled. The voices stopped together in an instant, leaving the world in an amplified silence. In their absence, a new sound filled the air. The voice returned. I hear you. It came as a whisper from behind, an ominous yet oddly playful presence that felt so close, but was truly still so far away. It let us breathe in the silence for a minute before it made us a promise. It was a promise we all knew to be true. I am coming. The voice was gone, and the air was again filled with screams. This time, they were from the living. After the voice had gone, we were left to our own devices. Millions panicked, and rightfully so, as chaos took hold of the streets. Many would die in the violence and the gunfire of that night. They would be known as the raptured before long, and the rest of us were the condemned. We could only wait. The screaming dead was only the first of the side effects that we felt as the voice approached. The closer it got, the more we felt it. That first night after the screaming, we noticed the stars bleed for the first time. A section of the western sky had turned black, blacker than the night. It was only truly visible because of the ring of stars around it. The light from those stars had turned red, and they seemed to bleed across the sky like food coloring dropped into water. Their light swirled and flowed all around the edge of some unseen mass. I knew then that I was staring into the face of the voice. Our scientists claimed that nothing was there, 
and that their radar and scans always came up empty. Their telescopes could see nothing but darkness in that section of space. However, the proof was right in front of us, as every night that ring of darkness got wider and more stars bled in the sky. We watched it come. As each night passed, the black spot would widen, and more stars would distort and bleed around it. During the day, a new hell would greet us. The side effects worsened. The day always brought something new. I'm sure most of what happened will go untold and unknown. The animals started disappearing, all of them. No tracks, traces, or bodies were left behind. Pets would run away, some violently so. They all retreated, never to be seen again. The forests were left abandoned, the oceans empty, the air was left silent. The world left seemed empty and lonely. They left like water receding from the shore just before the tsunami breaks. One day, about two weeks ago, scientists tried to talk to the voice again. They hoped, perhaps, to reason with it. They told it about what was happening on our world and asked it questions. The scientists begged. It didn't speak. When asked why, the voice sent a response. The next night, the skies lit up with streaks of fire. It was a light for hours, blazoned with orange and red. We didn't realize the effects until the next day when the televisions turned to static and the telephones refused to work. We had sat watching as all the satellites were knocked out of the heavens. After that, reports became rumors and rumblings, sanity a thing of the past. The air chilled and weighed us down. The voice was nearly here, and everyone felt it. It rained for a week after the satellites fell. The rain was salty and mired with an unknown filth that turned the grass black. Maybe the satellites tracked something back in with them when they hit the sky. No one knew for sure. All we know is that it fell from clouds black as charcoal that blotted out the sun like liquid ash. Darkness fell upon us for days. When the clouds went away, the skies were empty. There were no clouds, yet the sky hung low and gray. If the sun was anywhere in the sky, it never made itself known. Even it had abandoned us. Each day grew slowly darker and darker until night and day became almost the same. Some people would claim later that they'd seen things in the dark, creatures with gangly limbs and crooked faces lurking in the corner of their vision. They were tall, white creatures that looked molted or rotten through their transparent skin. Appearances would last for just a second or two before vanishing without a trace. Some believed this was the first step in the aliens' invasion, but the rest of us didn't know what to think. We just knew that it was nothing that simple or benign. They must have been hallucinations, just more madness to endure, but ultimately as harmless as anything else. As harmless as the screams of the dead, the missing animals, and the dying sky. Appearances slowly increased in duration and number. I think everyone saw them once at the least, but I don't think a single person would ever guess why they were truly here. They never touched nor spoke to anyone, and they certainly never harmed anyone. Most who got good looks at them described them as mournful or sorrowful-looking, 
Some even claimed the creatures watched over them at night, and others even claimed that it seemed as if the creatures were sorry for them. One claimed to have even seen one prostate upon the ground, hands clasped above its head. He said it was praying for us. Prayer was no help. The churches and places of worship that had divided us for so long failed to bring hope to any in the end. The voice let them pray and beg for a while, but just days ago the voice ended it all. No one questioned how, for at this point nothing that happened surprised anyone anymore. But on the final day, all books of worship burned. Every last Bible, every Koran, everything. People rushed to their centers of faith, but found no solace. The churches and temples had suffered the same fates, if not worse. The people were left abandoned by their greatest hopes. There were rumors of churches all over the world with walls formed from the bodies of those who sought refuge. They were merged to the walls, stuck to them like flies in a trap. They died, still pleading for hope, but they were beyond God's help. The rest of us had learned to stop begging. We waited. The final message came. From beyond the sky it fell upon us. The voice echoed, and it spoke the simple truth. I am here. There is a darkness beyond the horizon, the likes of which I doubt has ever been seen. It brings with it the screams of countless souls, and it moves fast. The stars are dying now, and I know they'll never be seen again. The light is dying so fast. I leave this not as a warning. No, it's far too late for that. Instead, consider this the last realization, the last humanity will ever know. For we used to wonder whether or not we were alone and lost, but never whether or not we were safe and hidden. The universe is infinite, and our understanding was significantly more finite. We should never have beckoned to the darkness. Instead, we should have clung to the light and closed our eyes every time we turned to the void. As the final minutes approached, I hold one final truth to be certain. I now know why the skies were always so quiet. Welcome back, kitties. I do hope you enjoyed that last yarn. Yarn? Tab! I am afraid that was our last story of the evening. But do not fear, for I shall return with more tales to tell next weekend. For now, I'd like to tell you how you can support this show a little more mm, directly. Just go to www.patreon.com slash themadcatter and subscribe for as little as one dollar a month. With that dollar, you'll get access to revised stories, early access to weekly episodes, as well as invitations to live broadcasts. Funds will, of course, go towards helping me expand the show and paying for more, well, tea. (laughs) Now, alas, my friends, the time has come. It does appear our stories are done. I am afraid that I must fly. But do come back, and please, don't cry. (laughs) (laughs) 
The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission or used via the Creative Commons license. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Details can be found in the show notes on our site. If you want more of me and my mischief, you can find my charming grin on Facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at SoundCloud.com slash Cheshire Hat or visit me at the website www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Sweet Sweet dreams. dreams.